Uh, so yeah, I will be talking about uh, point dipole and fluctuation dissipation theorem. And the concept of point dipole is, uh, I mean, everybody knows what is it. It's really simple, but I would argue it's somewhat deceptively simple. So I will be talking only about frequency domain, then you have uh, uh, incident fields like E0 and the dipole moment is related linearly to it and I will everywhere use dyadic or tensor so for general description and in, in this description it's really a phenomenological constant so the frequency is fixed and once you fix this then you also have field everywhere in space given by this quantity where G is the green tensor either of free space which is trivial or of some environment that is present like substrate uh, near the dipole. So that's uh, all known, but then you want some other measurable quantities like extinction, scattering, and absorption powers. And um, here again, some confusion starts in the literature that sometimes they're derived, sometimes they're postulated, and here are some of the possible expressions um, for that. Uh, so important part that for scattering here we use the GI, which is kind of imaginary part of the green stands about um, more, more generally as Q-Hermitian part. So in free space, it's just basically unit uh, dyadic, but in some environment, it can be more complex. And um, also in this phenomenological description, um, we don't have chi, so static possibility tensor. Again, there is a confusion with naming a lot. So I will use static or it's called bare plausibility and alpha is like dynamic or dress plausibility tensor. Mm, but the problem is that, um, so you can, you can write some definition like that, that chi is a limit of uh, to zero frequency of plausible, but it's not really operational unless you have some microscopic model because in phenomenological model that we discussed uh, here, well, for now, it's, it's just a, a constant. So you can't really take, take this limit. Uh, one way to connect these two quantities is to assume some empirical definition for like self-action of the dipole in itself. I mean, if you take it just bluntly, it will be singular, but you can take some regularization, for example, again, using this GI term. And then there is one of the possible expression that appear in the literature for connecting static and dynamic plausibilities. So that's part of the confusion. But uh, when we go to fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is, well, something probably you never need, but if you want to consider something like radiative heat transfer, Casimir forces, then it's very convenient. Uh, so you can compute some quantum quantities uh, in terms of classical electrodynamics. And this uh, theorem is really well established for fields or currents. So there is no problem with that. But uh, for a dipole or a system of point dipole, it's convenient to write it down in terms of uh, fluctuating dipole moments immediately, something like that. And again, in the literature, well, here are examples, you see different expressions. And the problem is that uh, you have either chi or alpha here, and the difference can be actually quite significant. So, so that's a potential problem that we have here. So given all these, um, I mean, introduction, our objective was to build a complete phenomenological description with a few assumptions of possible. So to resolve uh, some confusion, confusion and discuss relation between chi and alpha, which is, um, can also be related to concepts of radiative and non-radiative corrections of plausibility, which also often um, are mentioned in the literature. Uh, but then we take also the next step and make the same analysis, but with microscopic dipole model. And here we use either a small homogeneous sphere, the simplest model, or arbitrary small particles. And this part, well, in, in parts is, is really new. So we basically did all derivation based on the volume integral equation framework. And well, as you can see, there is really a lot uh, about it. And Hopefully our paper will appear soon, which is kind of semi-review paper, has a lot of math in it. Um, due to the limited time, I, I will only highlight some most important things in this talk, but feel free to ask me and I can send you the paper also if you're interested. Uh, so first we discuss the phenomenological model. We start with the green stands, as I mentioned, which is a contribution from free space and also some environment possibly. And then uh, we also use the source greens dyadic. That's exactly the one that um, the previous speaker uh, was also 
using so that's something that uh, connects FBTA current placed in one space to the field in another point, uh, which is induced both by environment and also by the dipole itself. Uh, so, so basically that's more or less its definition. And uh, our first result is that we show that you really need for a point dipole, you need only a single assumption to describe it phenomenologically, well, all of its optical properties. So you need to define the source uh, Green's dyadic. And, well, if you look at this equation, it's kind of natural, but once you do it, you can take, for example, a small sphere around the dipole, which is much smaller than distance to environment or sources, uh, and then integrate point in vector around it. And from this, you can rigorously derive all the quantities which I mentioned previously. And here, beta is, uh, well, a convenient definition like that. It looks a bit complicated, but that's mostly because we use this general tensorial description. So if all, everything is scalar, then it would be uh, much simpler. Uh, again, as I said previously, this description does not need a chi at all because we have only a single definition, single assumption, and this assumption uh, contains alpha as a phenological constant in it. But if we assume that absorption power is given by this equation, which is kind of logical because absorption is a local property, so it should be determined by something like internal fields inside the dipole, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, and then if you assume this and just compare these two expression, we can actually derive the following relation between static and dynamic plausibility. Importantly, it relates only the imaginary or skew parts of the plausibility. So that actually justifies the radiative correction of the plausibility, but not, not radiative correction, because non-radiative correction relates uh, the real or Hermitian parts of these plausibilities. And, and well, this expression says nothing about it. So non-radiative corrections remain ambiguous. And for a deeper discussion of, of this concept, we need to consider what is the proper asymptotic limit in this case. Uh, the problem is that um, whenever you consider a small dipole, you implicitly assume that it's small, yeah, obviously. So, but when the dipole is small, actually its plausibility as shown here, well normalized uh, properly is also small. So that's kind of implicit assumption that you have. And then if this is small, then those two should be large. So then you may think that, okay, we can always neglect this term and no correction is needed um, at all. And this, in some cases, true, but not if absorption is small. So if the imaginary part of uh, chi is much smaller than chi itself, uh, well, absolute values, uh, or some norm of the dyadic, uh, or absorption is not present, for example, then definitely you cannot uh, neglect this term. And this brings us to a proper understanding of asymptotic equivalence, which we will describe by this symbol. Uh, so we say that two, uh, two quantities are asymptotically equivalent if they give, uh, if they're like, oh, uh, well, in the limit, they have the same uh, small size limit, but this limit should be uniform for all levels of absorption. So in this sense, the real parts are always asymptotically equivalent. And for example, beta is always asymptotically equivalent to a part of chi, but alpha and chi imaginary parts of them, they are not asymptotically equivalent. So, and that's justified that we should include radiative corrections. So they're important for this asymptotic limit to hold. But non-radiative corrections, as I mentioned previously, they actually asymptotically negligible. Uh, and well, fin the final point of this phenomenological theory is that we can, again, based on this single assumption of source Green's dyadic, we can derive the FDT. And for that, we, we do it in the most general setting of tensorial everything. And uh, basically we have it for, for the fields. Uh, so the expression is, uh, uh, expression for the uh, fields is uh, given here. Uh, it's either for fields in the bath or the, for the total field. And then from this, after a lot of algebra, you derive the expression for fluctuating dipole. So that's basically one of the expression that was used in the literature, but disproves the other expression and that's completely irrelevant. Having said all this, uh, let us discuss really briefly because I don't have time for that. What happens if we have a microscopic model? And the simplest one is a homogeneous sphere. So the first important thing here uh, that the roles of chi and alpha are reversed because uh, everybody knows the electrostatic solution for a sphere and it gives us electrostatic plausibility. So no problem with that. We need only to know that the electric function. Here we have a, a, a 
uh, scala expression, but it can be, well, tensorial as well. Uh, the problem is then that we have a lorentz me solution again. Um, it solves us everything, but given this uh, solution, it's not trivial to unambiguously define the plausibility. At least there are several options which are mentioned here. And all those formulations are actually logically equivalent. And they also have same radiative correction, but the non-radiative corrections, they are different for this. And this we discuss in the paper in greater detail. And so I would argue that, uh, I'm not arguing that you should not use this uh, non-radiative correction, but the proper choice, I think, will depend on the specific experiment. So that's kind of a problem with them. And also, Another issue that if you look closely, like on the total dark moment in the next order correction, it will depend not only on the incident field, but also on the derivatives of the field. Uh, there was a talk uh, about it yesterday, I think. Uh, so that's another issue which adds ambiguity here. But then after we say this, we can also derive all other properties like absorption, whatever powers and, F and the FDT from the first principle. So we don't need any empirical assumption here. And the next step is to bring it all to arbitrary uh, particles, uh, arbitrary shape particle. And again, uh, the problem, well, it can be solved, but it's obvious stock. you need to make some effort to solve the problem for arbitrary particle. Here we write it down in terms of transition dedic operator. So we assume it to be null. And once we do it, we can define anything we want. So for example, the static possibility is given through the static op operator and the dynamic possibility is given through the well standard dynamic uh, solution at some fixed frequency. Again, here you have asymptotic equivalent. So that's one of the possible definitions. And well, if you're more fond of say, uh, which uh, more or less the same operator, but in spherical or wave function basis, then you can also do it. And one thing that we kind of accidentally uh, obtained in all these um, rigorous expression is the expansion of inverse plausibility in powers of A. So it's shown here. And uh, so it starts from A to power minus three terms uh, here. And then you have uh, the new correction, which is kind of complicated. But for uh, radiative correction, you have a uh, you, you have a clear expression, so that's kind of justifies the use uh, of specific form of radiative correction. This was conjectured partly in the paper by Vadim Markel, but we proved it in a general setting. So that brings uh, me to my conclusions. So first, uh, well, I argue that we built a complete phenological description that can be based on a single assumption, including the well, it, it gives us a rigorous derivation of the FDT in most general setting. Then we showed from all points of view that we considered uh, the radiative correction is completely unambiguous and well established. By contrast, not radiative corrections are ambiguous and actually asymptotically negligible. So you really should uh, try uh, to find a specific experimental setting where they would be. And all these conclusions, they remain valid for small homogeneous particles. And um, also we showed the expansion of inverse plausibility into powers of particle size. So again, I uh, bring your attention to this paper, which have a lot of math and it kind of builds a complete framework for analysis of this problem. So if you uh, want to do something, I mean, the next step within it, then probably that would be useful uh, for you. And finally, I thank uh, Russian Science Foundation for funding and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Maxim. Uh, so, um, I think uh, we have uh, a question from Hub. Yeah, we have only one question, so please, yes. Pavel. Yeah, yes. so very simple question. You de defined your Xi as something at the zero frequency. Can you somehow adapt your formulas uh, for dispersive materials, can we put non-constant epsilon, epsilon which depends on, on the frequency somehow at that? Because this is probably which, something which is interesting for uh, calculations of for real applications. Yeah, yeah, th that's exactly what I meant here. It's basically that e everywhere where people use static, they actually mean that it's for a given epsilon. So you kind of want to take the limit of to zero frequency, but keep epsilon fixed at some frequency, which is kind of of interest for you. 
So okay. uh, basically, in, in, I can use just the uh, ordinary formulas, just putting any arbitrary epsilon there. So I'm taking static formula, but placing, I would say, uh, epsilon for particular frequency. Yeah, it losses with everything. Because yes, yes, yes. But, but losses will be some issues because at zero frequency, it's hard to have losses. Well, yeah, that's more or less what you do. But I think your question more or less highlights the confusion that is related to all, to all this issue. So we, we kind of, well, partly solved it, but in, indeed it's, uh, it's, it's again depends on where you start. So I just shown first, uh, if you have just phenological description like a point space, then it's uh, very natural to have alpha and you don't need anything else. But uh, if you start really with a small sphere of, or something, then you have chi unambiguously, and then you need to like uh, have, have some formula for alpha, and that's what where all these like radiative and non-radiative corrections come into play. So people don't want like a, a complete uh, exact solution; they want some simple formula, and that's where confusion comes—a cost for this simplicity. Yeah. 